Today you're going to learn how to build a solid load balancing solution for Kubernetes. Let's start by looking at the resources Kubernetes gives you for load balancing. First, you've got services, which give you a stable IP and DNS endpoint that routes traffic to one or more pods. There are three types, each including the type that came before it. A cluster IP service creates an address that is only accessible from within the cluster. This is useful if you have a workload that's consumed by other workloads inside the cluster, like think a database or anything that doesn't directly need to be hit from outside the cluster. Then there's the node port service, which creates a cluster IP service and then exposes it on every node in the cluster on a high port between 32,000 and 32767. This is best suited for environments that have an external load balancer or for workloads where the port doesn't matter. Imagine that you're running a database within the cluster, but you still need to load data into it from your workstation. You can use a node port service to expose the database service on some random port, connect to it with your client, load the data, and then change the service back to a cluster IP service. If you have an external load balancer, you can put all of the cluster nodes into its node pool for your site, and then tell the load balancer to send traffic to the node port service. The load balancer can receive traffic, do things like SSL termination, and then send it through to the cluster. It also does health checking, so if one of your nodes goes down, the load balancer is going to see that and stop sending traffic to it. This lets you do things like node maintenance and upgrades without worrying about the load balancer sending traffic to an offline node. The external load balancer doesn't have to be some fancy thing from F5 or A10 or Z20 or R30. It can be an external node running HAProxy or Nginx, or something like a pair of nodes using KeepAlive-D to share an IP address. The problem with all of this is that you now have to make changes in two places, first in the cluster and then in the load balancer, and that's an opportunity for mistakes that create downtime. Downtime sucks. Just the other day, I was creating a video about how to troubleshoot a problem with a workload that had an expired certificate. Let's Encrypt reported that the certificate was renewed, but the MQTT server was still using the old certificate. I deleted the pod, and instead of coming back up on another node, the cluster got confused about where a volume was attached and it wouldn't restart the pod. I drained the node, which cordoned it, but the volume still wouldn't attach. I rebooted the node. Volumes wouldn't attach. One of the volumes on the now dead node was for the database, so pretty much every other workload running in the cluster went down. Ultimately, it came down to a bug in the storage driver for the provider where I was running the cluster, and long story short, it took their engineering department more than eight hours to figure out how to get my cluster back online. Now, stuff happens. Unexpected downtime is unexpected, and we want to be as prepared for it as we can. In my experience, there's a direct corollary between more prepared and more expensive with diminishing returns beyond a certain point. And what I mean by that is that you can spend a small amount of money in the beginning and get a huge improvement in reliability, but over time you can spend a lot of money and get a small improvement. We have to find a place that balances cost, preparedness, and risk, because if there's anything worse than unexpected downtime, it's downtime for something that we could have prevented. You see, human error is avoidable. And that brings us to the next service type, which is a service type of load balancer. This will create a cluster IP service, then a node port service, and then it will reach out to the cloud provider over their API and create a load balancer. It'll program that load balancer with the IPs and ports for the nodes and the node port service, and then it will keep that list accurate over time as nodes come and go. It basically removes the human from having to configure the load balancer or remember to update it. So in my opinion, that's a win. Or is it? Each service of type load balancer creates a new load balancer in the provider network. That load balancer costs money. Load balancing technology long ago adopted things like name-based virtual hosting and IP consolidation tactics that let you run HTTP-style workloads for different hosts on the same IP address. Are we taking a step backwards? I mean, it's only $20 a month, so it doesn't matter, right? It's easy to say that when it's not your money, but as a former business owner, I can tell you that it matters. Money spent on things that can be done differently is money that's wasted, and wasted money is always bad. I don't care how rich you are or how much funding your company has, you don't stay rich by burning money. The load balancer service type requires that the Kubernetes cluster know that it's running in a cloud provider, that it knows which cloud provider, and that it knows how to talk to it. This means that you have to set up security policies for your Kubernetes nodes when you deploy them, granting them permission to create load balancers in the provider's network. It means that you have to be running your cluster in one of the handful of providers that Kubernetes knows how to talk to, or that you're using a hosted Kubernetes solution like DigitalOcean, who runs a modified version of Kubernetes that integrates with their services. 
It also means that if you don't set up your nodes correctly when you launch them, you either can't use the load balancer service or you have to rebuild the cluster. That's a lot of mud to slog through. And we'll come back to services in a second, but I want to talk about ingresses first. Ingresses are how the community responded to the shortcomings of the service resource. An ingress is basically a set of routing instructions for HTTP-like workloads. An ingress controller is a software load balancer like Nginx or HAProxy or Traffic, or an API gateway like Kong or Glue or any of a number of other things that receive traffic, parse it, look at the routing instructions for it, and then send it on to a service. Each ingress controller offers its own set of useful features, and I'll talk about those in a different video. For now, just think of it as moving the load balancer functionality back into the cluster. Now you can change your external load balancer from layer 7, the layer with an evolved brain, to layer 4, the layer with a very basic brain. Layer 4 load balancers will receive traffic on a port and send it on to the back ends without trying to parse it. You can do SSL termination on it, but generally you'll want to keep it as simple as possible so that your control of the process stays within the Kubernetes cluster. By using an ingress controller, you can have a single external load balancer for all of your services, and if you're in a cloud provider, that can save you a bunch of money. Ingress controllers will also handle layer 4 traffic, so you can load balance non-HTTP services like MQTT or services that have a TLS layer baked into them. Some will even load balance UDP traffic, which is cool if you're into that sort of thing. Now, what if you don't have an external load balancer and you're not in a cloud provider where you can spin one up? Solutions like Kubernetes solve problems for the majority, but that doesn't mean that the minority should be left out. If you're running Kubernetes on-prem, in a data center, or in a lab, in a development environment, or at the edge, you shouldn't be forced to compromise. That's like saying that you don't get to sit at the table because you don't look like everyone else or fit some mold. I get that they can't solve everyone's problem, but with a little bit of ingenuity, we can build a solution that works. Before we do that, let's quickly cover what happens when you run an ingress controller in a multi-node cluster without an external load balancer. An ingress controller will listen on multiple nodes in the cluster. Traffic can land on any of those nodes and it'll get routed to the right service and then to the right pods. But if you put multiple addresses in the DNS record for the application, what happens when one of the nodes is down? That's right, we're right back where we started. Without something checking the health of the endpoint, some percentage of the traffic will still go to the unresponsive node and that's gonna result in a bad user experience. That's the problem that we wanna solve and for that, we are gonna to turn to MetalLB. MetalLB is a service that runs in your Kubernetes cluster. You assign it a block of addresses from your local network, and when you create a service of type load balancer, MetalLB allocates one of those addresses to the service and assigns it to a host. It then starts announcing that address with the MAC address of the host, and it can do this in one of two ways. The easiest way is that it ARPs at layer two. Everything else in the broadcast domain hears the announcement and traffic is routed to the host. The other way that it can work is if you have a BGP infrastructure in place. MetalLB can make announcements into BGP, and then BGP does the rest. Now, that's a better solution if you need things outside of the broadcast domain to know how to find the service. Now, in order to work, this requires some prerequisites. First, you have to be able to dynamically assign IPs to nodes. That's not going to work in a provider that limits you to a single IP per node, so MetalLB is not going to work in most public cloud providers. That's fine, though, because they have load balancers that we can use at layer 4. The next thing that it requires is the ability to send ARP announcements. This is standard on layer two networks, but if you're using any fancy switching fabric with static ARP entries on ports, you may have to make some changes before MetalLB will work. Otherwise, that's it. You set it up and it works. If a node goes down, the IP and its announcements move to another node in the cluster and traffic fails over to it. What else might fail in this scenario? You're probably concerned that there's a single IP address on a single node. But if you look at two node active passive load balancers, they work the same way. The address to which you're sending traffic is a virtual address. And if it needs to fail over to the standby node, that node takes over the IP and starts announcing it at layer two. If anything, MetalLB is more robust because you aren't limited to two nodes. Any node in your cluster can host that address. The rest of the issues are about resource availability. You can assign MetalLB to specific nodes in the cluster. So you could even allocate two nodes for load balancing and restrict normal workloads from running there. Let's go deploy it. Here we have a single node Kubernetes cluster with Tiller installed because we're going to install MetalLB from Helm. The installation process is so simple that I'm honestly a little bit embarrassed to show it here. It's literally Helm install from the stable repo, but I recommend that you put it into its own namespace. Since it's a system level resource, I'll use MetalLB system. It goes in without a hitch, 
and it comes up super fast. Before we can use it, we have to add the config file that tells it what addresses to use. Par for the course, if you've been watching my channel for any length of time, you know that I have a knack for finding broken documentation. Today's no exception. On their install page, they say to create the metallb-config config map, and then they link to an example. The example that they link to is actually named config, not metallb-config, and if you copy and paste it, the service is never going to come up. I have an open pull request for the docs that fixes that, and hopefully they'll merge it after this video comes out. So grab that config, change the name, set the namespace if you installed it into metallb-system like I did, give it a block of addresses to manage, and apply it. Now we can launch our demo container, but instead of configuring a cluster IP service and an ingress, we're going to configure a service of type load balancer and set it to listen on port 80. Set a cow color, click launch, and in a few seconds the workload shows that it's up and listening on port 80. If we click that, we're taken to the IP address, and sure enough, there it is. Jumping back to the command line, you can see that it deployed the cluster IP service and then the load balancer service, mapping port 80 to port 32723 as an intermediate node port service. So now what? For starters, now that you're running on your own infrastructure, you don't need to use an ingress controller for routing. If you want to assign an IP to each web service, you can do that just by deploying a service of type load balancer for each application. Or if you're running a workload like MQTT, you can just expose it and it'll work. But where Metal LB really shines is when you put an ingress controller behind it. Earlier I said that if you have an ingress controller listening on multiple nodes with nothing doing health checking, traffic might land on a node that's down. By putting the ingress controller behind Metal LB, you have Metal LB responsible for keeping the address alive, and then it routes traffic directly to the cluster IP service for the ingress controller. You can set this up with the Nginx ingress controller, but let's do it with traffic instead. I'll have a whole video on using traffic as your ingress controller, so for today, we're just going to do the install with some basic Helm values to get it set up. When I launched this cluster a few minutes ago, I told Rancher not to install the Nginx ingress controller. We already have Tiller and Metal LB running inside of it, but before we launch traffic, we have to set some parameters. Traffic is designed to run in lots of places, not just inside Kubernetes. This flexibility carries over to how it's configured, and there are lots of options in the default values.yaml file that we're not going to look at today. The nice thing about Helm is that if you somehow screw this up, you can just adjust the values and run Helm upgrade and it'll reconfigure itself. That's what happened to me. So for now, here's what we're gonna set. We want to enable RBAC. The Helm chart will handle installing the cluster role and cluster role binding for us, so that's sufficient. Then we wanna set the service type to load balancer. If you're in a cloud provider, this will provision their service, but for us, it's going to provision with Metal LB. I turn the dashboard on and give it a host name that I'll configure with DNS later. Even though I'm running this in my house, it's a good practice to configure basic auth for the dashboard. I'd like to see this configured with a secret, but it is what it is. To generate the hashed password, you can use HT password on any system that supports it, or there are online generators like this one at htaccesstools.com. Be careful that you put this into the dashboard section and not the earlier section where you can add basic auth to every route that traffic creates with SSL. The output from httaccesstools.com doesn't include a space between the colon and the password, so be sure to add that if you're using their service. If you don't, you'll get an error because it's not valid YAML. Moving on, we come to the Kubernetes section, which needs to be uncommented. You'll also want to uncomment ingress endpoint and set use default published service to true. Kubernetes needs this to connect the ingress to the service and show the correct IP in the kubectl output. With all of that done, we can do the installation, and then we'll do some quick cleanup in the Rancher UI. Before we can see the traffic output, we need to add the namespace for traffic to the system project. We'll go ahead and add that and the Metal LB namespace to the project as well. Now we can see that traffic is behind a service of type load balancer, and that it's been given one of the IPs from our Metal LB pool. Once we've added our DNS entry for the dashboard, we can hit that in a browser. Earlier, we created a load balancer service for our workload. Let's change that now to a cluster IP service and add an ingress. By adding that to the DNS record, we can now go to the host name instead of the IP, and there's our workload. It also shows up in the traffic dashboard, and because we told Kubernetes to use the default published service, everything is green. MetalLB makes services of type load balancer useful in Kubernetes clusters that don't run in a cloud provider. 
But what if you're running somewhere with extra restrictions? Maybe you don't have a block of IP addresses available, or maybe you have the static ARP restriction that I described earlier. Maybe you're in an edge environment and you just want to keep things simple. K3S is a lightweight Kubernetes solution that is unbelievably fast. It ships with traffic as its ingress controller, and it uses Clipper LB to handle load balancer services. Clipper LB works differently from Metal LB. Instead of allocating an address from a pool, it uses a host port for the pod. It relies on Kubernetes to find a node with the port free, and if one isn't available, the load balancer service stays in a pending state. It's not a solution that's necessarily better or worse, it's just different. K3S is designed to run in resource-constrained environments where there might only be a single node in the cluster. In that case, Clipper LB is better than Metal LB because it requires no additional addresses or configuration. It just makes it possible for traffic to work as an ingress controller. What happens if you use it in a multi-node cluster and the node where the host port was listening goes down? When the second node was added to the K3S cluster, the Clipper LB service began listening on that node as well. This implies that it's going to continue to listen on port 80 on all nodes when added to the cluster, which is fine because traffic can load balance HTTP and TCP services on any port. Now this is probably because traffic requires a service of type load balancer in order to operate on port 80, and Metal LB won't work without additional IPs. There has to be a trade-off between functionality and the overall mass of the solution. Traffic has more features than Nginx, and Metal LB requires additional IPs, so with Clipper LB, we kind of have the best of both worlds. It does mean that if you have more than one K3S node, you'll have to use something external to the cluster for traffic routing and health checking of the nodes. Now we add a workload, and if we added an ingress for it, it would work fine. However, as promised in the documentation, adding an additional service of type load balancer on port 80 results in the load balancer service staying in a pending state. All right, let's recap. If you're in a cloud provider, you can burn money by using a service of type load balancer for every single one of your workloads. Or you can use a layer four load balancer and send all traffic to an ingress controller running on the cluster. If you're on-prem, you can use a service like Metal LB with a pool of IP addresses to handle load balancer services for your workloads, and you can put it in front of an ingress controller and give you access to layer seven decision-making for HTTP workloads. If you don't have a bunch of addresses, or if you're running a single node cluster, or if you have ARP restrictions in your network, you can use Clipper LB to open a host port and route it to the correct cluster IP service inside the cluster. This makes it easy to swap out the Nginx ingress controller for traffic, which then leads to using mesh as a lightweight service mesh in the cluster. I'll have that for you in a future video, but I think that's enough for today. Go forth and install Metal LB or Clipper LB in your clusters and let me know how it goes in the comments below.